I'm happy to be with you today to talk about long COVID, what we have learned so far. I think we all saw this report uh, back in June uh, of 2020 when Professor Gardner, a professor of epidemiology at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine uh, wrote, I'm unable to be out of bed for more than three hours at a stretch. My arms and legs are permanently fizzing as if injected with uh, Szechuan peppercorns. I have ringing in the ears, intermittent brain fog, palpitations, and dramatic mood swings. And I think this really was one of the earliest uh, descriptions we had of what we now know as, as post-acute sequela of COVID, or also known as of long COVID. But we also saw Ed Young in the Atlantic write this fantastic piece in August of 2020, again, trying to understand this linger Ill illness that we were seeing in, in our patients. Similar reports appeared in, in Nature, as well as in JAMA, that really started making us think about this so-called COVID long haulers. Now, we have to realize that at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of people ended up in the ICU. And, and what we saw in survivors of COVID after staying in the ICU were joint uh, contractures, muscle wasting, upper extremity uh, weakness, diaphragm dysfunction, impairments of memory, uh, persistent fatigue. But many of those symptoms actually are no different than the kind of long-term cognitive impairments that you see after a critical illness. And in this New England Journal of Medicine paper from 2013, we can see that many people have, that have survived an ICU uh, many months after they've been there continue to have uh, problems with cognition, problems with, 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 with critical thinking. So how much of this is, is the ICU and how much of this is COVID is something that really needed to be worked out. But as I said, clinicians started to observe prolonged sequelae of COVID, people with persistent symptoms, even when they're not in the ICU. And one of the third things that had to happen is we had to have a definition. And until fairly recently, there was really no consensus definition. Uh, and people also had different names, long COVID, long haulers, post-acute sequela of, of, of SARS-CoV-2. So here is, is one of the first articles that appeared uh, on, on the definitions, and they talked about post-acute COVID as persistent symptoms extending beyond three weeks after initial symptoms, and chronic COVID as persistent symptoms extending beyond 12 weeks after initial symptoms. Now, the CDC has now uh, published a definition and what they, uh, they call uh, post-COVID conditions. And among these COVID conditions are a series of, of manifestations that are known to persist for a long time. Uh, similarly, the WHO uh, had a clinical case definition through by a Delta consensus and in, in October of 2021 uh, defined long COVID as a, as a condition that occurs in individuals with a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, usually three months uh, from the onset of COVID with symptoms that last for at least two months and cannot be explained by an alternative diagnosis. There have been a variety of population-based studies that have been done. And one of them is a COVID symptom study. This is done via an app in which individuals in the US and the UK and Sweden have entered symptoms. There's more than 5 million people now in this app. And data here suggests that about 10 to 50% of individuals with COVID-19 even mild cases do not recover quickly and continue to have symptoms beyond three months. There was also this MMWR in which CDC looked at people who had been tested as outpatients had never been hospitalized. And, and you know, in this study, one in five uh, of previously healthy adults weren't back to their usual health, you know, within three weeks of testing positive. And 35% and of them had not returned to the usual health. Now, there's a recent meta-analysis published uh, looking at, at how common this is, what is the global prevalence. And as you can see, series from really everywhere, you know, from Europe, from Latin America, from North America, from the US, uh, from the UK, really go all over the place, right? Anywhere between, you know, 10% to 80% of individuals having uh, symptoms of post-acute sequela of COVID. And a lot of it depends whether the individuals were hospitalized or non-hospitalized. And when you think about, uh, in general, series that focus just in hospitalized patients have much by higher prevalence than those that focus in non-hospitalized patients, but still the numbers are not insignificant. And in the study, the, the median was around 45%. And, and the most recent study uh, uh, done by, by Kaiser here in Atlanta uh, showed that 
two out of three uh, individuals who had tested positive for COVID and who didn't require hospital stay, stay had at least one outpatient visit one to six months after their diagnosis. And the most common cause for their visits were chest pain or throat pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, and a chronic cough. In this study recently published in Lancet of persistent of, of symptoms after COVID in the Netherlands, you know, they, it's a very uh, well done population based study, and 21% had persistent symptoms uh, compared to a control group that only had 8% had symptoms. And the excess in, in symptoms included things like chest pain, difficulty breathing, muscle pain, chest tiredness, and headaches. And in, in global, you know, 12.7% or what would be one in eight individuals who had COVID. Uh, went on to develop this symptom. So what is the pathogenesis? What do we know about pathogenesis of, of long COVID? Well, there are a couple of studies, uh, including this one uh, by Dr. Awasaki at, at, at Yale, suggesting that reactivation of herpes viruses, such as EVV or VCV, and multiple uh, antibodies, uh, plus cellular immune markers uh, act activation, and, and levels of cortisol uh, that are uniformly low are, are common in people with long COVID. However, in contrast, there is the study from the NIH, from uh, Cliff Lane and his group, in which they looked at carefully at, at immunology in, in people that had a post-acute sequela of COVID, and they found no evidence of persistent viral infection, autoimmunity, or abnormal immune activation. So we really need to first uh, define really the pathogenesis of the syndrome. And I think a lot of work is being done to try to get us to really understand the pathogenesis because this is gonna be key in developing therapeutics. So what are the kind of symptoms that you see? Well, the most important thing is that a lot of the symptoms occur regardless of age, comorbid conditions, or degree of severity of the COVID-19 illness. And if you think about the pathogenesis of the disease, you know, you get infected, you get a PCR positive, you get, uh, then the person becomes PCR negative and they're, they're no longer infected, you know, by week 12, but they continue to have this post-acute sequela of COVID, continue to have the symptoms that we talked about from fatigue to muscle, to joint pains, to dyspnea, and many of the other symptoms that we'll talk more in a second. This is one of the first studies published, this was from Italy, in which they look at 143 hospitalized patients with a median age of 56 years, 53% were female, 12.6% required ICU admission. And as you can see from, from this study, uh, fatigue, dyspnea, joint pains, and chest pain were the common symptoms. And, and you know, while 12% while of patients had no symptoms, uh, fully 55% uh, uh, of them had more than three symptoms, uh, you know, as they were followed over time. And, and this study among healthcare workers, uh, showed that among individuals who were tested positive for COVID, 26% uh, uh, report at least one moderate to severe symptom lasting greater than two months, 15% report at least one moderate to severe symptom lasting more than eight months, and 12% reported symptoms causing disruptions in home life, and 8% on work life. So again, you know, the spectrum is pretty long, but you can see it's a fair number of individuals continue to have symptoms that disrupt their work life, their social life, or their home life. Now, we also see symptoms of long COVID in children in adolescence, and you can see in the study, while the, the numbers in children uh, uh, tend to be smaller and the symptoms tend to be less severe, uh, you do get also the symptomatic uh, manifestations in children, and in particular, the issues related to mental health and other abnormalities that you can see more in children than in adults. So what is the evaluation? What do we need to do with a patient that presents with this kind of symptoms? Well, I think we need to look at, at how, what, what they're doing from a pulmonary standpoint, you know, look at PFTs, do a chest X-ray, uh, maybe a, a, a more in-depth pulmonary workup or cardiovascular workup with an echo when indicated. We need to look at neuropsychiatric manifestations. We need to look at renal manifestations, hematological manifestations. And very importantly, we need to consider the kind of rehabilitation that is gonna be needed for this patient as they, as, as they try to re-engage in normal life. So what are the most common uh, presentations that we see now with the syndrome? Well, let's start about talking first about the cardiac complications. These manifestations include myocarditis and ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, the pathogenesis is probably through direct invasion of the virus, but also inflammation and blunting of ACE2 receptors. 
And we really don't know what the long-term consequence is going to be. Are we going to see an increase in heart failure as a result of, of long COVID? And you can see from this, uh, this article written by Eric Topol in Science, the kind of damage to the heart inflicted either by the virus or by cytokines and the complication of both uh, can lead to really uh, damage to the cardiomyocytes, necrosis, cardiogenic shock, and eventually myocardial inflammation and arrhythmias that could be very persistent in many individuals. There is a study from, uh, from Germany in which they looked at a tissue from 39 consecutive autopsies and they found uh, SARS-CoV infection uh, documented in 61%. And then uh, if those that had high viral loads in the plasma, this was documented in 41%. And again, the cytokine response was also important. And, and this is something to, to be thinking that this is just not only inflammation, but it's also the impact of the virus in the myocardium. Well, how about the pulmonary manifestations? A chronic cough, a fibrotic lung disease, bronchiectasis, and pulmonary vascular disease are the most common manifestations. And these are due to inflammation as well as fibrosis and thromboembolic disease. And the, you know, the obvious question to many of us is, is will this be an increase in cases of COPD or pulmonary fibrosis as a result? And it's worth noticing that in many uh, lo the localities nowadays, now the number one cause for pulmonary transplantation is indeed post-acute sequela of COVID. Uh, the neuropsychiatric complications include headache, dizziness, trouble concentrating, confusion, hallucinations, and even stroke. And the pathogenesis is inflammation or direct viral in infection of the brain as well as hypoxia. And again, are we going to see long-term uh, COVID brain, you know, individuals that simply cannot concentrate, cannot do their work, and essentially become disabled as a result of the syndrome? Now, I think it's interesting to look at the study. They, this is an, an EHR study with over 81 million patients, of which about 236,000 have been diagnosed with COVID. And the incidence of neurological psychiatric diagnosis in the six months following COVID was 33.6%, uh, with 12, almost 13% receiving that diagnosis uh, for the first time. And obviously, this was more severe in people who had uh, severe COVID, but it was not just in people who had severe COVID. Almost everybody else could also have this syndrome. Now, how about the kidney? You can see proteinuria, you can see renal failure, and some patients will go on to require dialysis, many of them because they were in the ICU and, and as a result of their viral, uh, their severe disease had renal damage. But some of it may be direct viral infection of the kidneys, could be hypoxia or thromboembolic microangiopathy. And will we be seeing an increase in chronic renal failure and dialysis as a result of this, I think is one of the important questions that we're all asking. Other organs that can be infected, affected include the gastrointestinal tract, bones, uh, the endocrine organs, and the skin. And I, I want to particularly mention diabetes because we know that diabetes is associated with an increased risk of severe COVID. But new onset of diabetes, including DKA and hyperosmolar coma, have been observed in patients after COVID. And we have to remember there's ACE2 receptors in the pancreatic guideline cells. And therefore, there may be a diabetogenic effect of COVID-19 and in fact, there is now a COVID diet project that is, is collecting individuals with diabetes after COVID and trying to understand the pathogenesis of this really interesting syndrome. Now, one of the questions that frequently comes up is, do, if I'm vaccinated, am I protecting against long COVID? And in general, you know, data has been, has been uh, there's positive data and negative data, but if you can look at, at this study, if you have been vaccinated with two doses, the possibility of going on to develop symptoms of COVID, this is the, 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 the lines uh, in sort of uh, uh, pink, uh, you know, are much lower than in those that were uh, unvaccinated. And if you look at the unvaccinated here in blue, uh, the rates are much, much higher than in those that, that, uh, that were vaccinated, especially if they received two doses. Now, their kind of symptoms they get are still more severe than people who are uninfected. So the best thing to protect you from long COVID is actually not to get infected. Even though vaccines do seem to decrease the risk of developing long COVID, they're not protected. And here's another study in which they looked at patients who had received one dose uh, prior to the diagnosis of COVID, and they were, they were seven to 10 times less likely to report uh, long COVID. And Unvaccinated patients who received their first vaccine within four weeks of COVID were four to six times less likely to report long COVID. And those who received their first vaccine four to eight weeks after diagnosis were three times less likely to report long COVID. So when somebody has not been vaccinated and they develop COVID, 
it's important that we get them vaccinated uh, fairly quickly within four weeks to try to, again, maybe decrease their odds of developing long COVID. Now, now that we have tried to understand this and the magnitude, there's a lot of trials taken off and starting uh, to try to, uh, to treat uh, long COVID. And there's at least 26 randomized trials, according to this paper recently published in Nature, looking at candidate therapies for long COVID. And they can be roughly, roughly divided into anti-inflammatories and cell-based therapies and antithrombotics, dietary supplements, steroids, and others. And many of them are now in phase two and some of them are in phase three. But I think obviously uh, the, the kind of studies that are being started, I think are very important and they go all the way from you know, antidepressants to many other drugs that are being studied. Uh, you know, back in, in October of 2020, I wrote one of the first uh, articles together with, with colleagues, uh, Laura Collins and Lauren Collins and, and Pretty Milani looking at, at what long COVID meant and what does it mean to the overall population? And we said in that paper that long ranging longitudinal observation studies and clinical trials are gonna be critical to elucidate the health consequences attributable to COVID-19 and how this compared with other serious illnesses. And we're very pleased that, uh, and part of the problem obviously is that the, the, there's bias in the way we're looking at long COVID, right? There is clear biases and we need to have really well-established cohorts that we studied and not just be looking at, at, at case reports. And for that, I think it's really important to realize that the NIH has launched a new initiative to study long COVID. Uh, this new initiative uh, through NHLBI, I think is gonna be critically important in understanding the syndrome. And, and this is called the recover study. Uh, and you need to look at if in your community, there's a recover site, because this is a very good way uh, to build a, a, a nationwide study population to support research on the long uh, term effects of COVID and trying to understand the pathogenesis and the prevention and treatment of this condition. So in conclusion, I think the post-acute sequela of COVID is not one condition, but it's actually a heterogeneous condition. And the pathophysiology is likely to be multifactorial. I think signals of deconditioning, uh, preload insufficiency, uh, problems with oxygenation have been identified. And the severity of the initial COVID infection it is not necessarily associated with differences in extra capacity. Recovery time is variable, but it does occur. And I think it's best to take a multidisciplinary approach to the management of these patients. Likely, uh, uh, you know, as a result of this syndrome and as a result of the number of people who've been infected and worldwide, there's going to be a large number of patients who experience long-term sequelae of COVID. And, and, and as a result, we're seeing uh, many places opening uh, post-COVID clinics, and uh, primarily in, seri in places where large outbreaks have occurred. And as I said, the recovered cohort established by NIH and NHLBI, I think is going to be critically important in understanding the syndrome. And this cohort is also going to provide an opportunity to efficiently and systematically conduct studies of therapeutic interventions to mitigate the adverse physical and mental health effects among uh, hundreds, if not millions, of people who have recovered from COVID. And then with this, uh, I'll end and, and happy to take any questions.